Hello and welcome back to the Prehistoric Aquarium today for the penultimate episode for this season. So if you have any comments or questions that you want answered in the season finale next week, please do let us know. We're going to start with something that I think a few people have asked for, a sort of glass tunnel that you can walk through, see all the creatures around you, and yeah, that's what's going to go through here. Kind of realised that I want the next area over here, so actually I'm going to try and make it a bit like a junction, if that makes sense. Just nipping back in time to get some underwater plants because it's genuinely easier than looking up in the menu. So this is the kind of terrain that I'm going for. It's sort of a, you know, like a dark volcanic seabed. I want it to be sort of gloomy, but then you've got the sort of lights coming through here. It should look quite cool, I think. And yeah, in this tank, we're basically just going to throw all the jellyfish in because I've got nowhere else to put them. And it's not really my area of expertise. I'm probably not going to go through every single species, but it is important to point out that jellyfish have been around for over half a billion years. They're one of the longest surviving groups out there, and their fossils are really interesting. And they're interesting because they're really rare. We've mentioned a few times now that we only find fossils of, well, we generally only find fossils of the harder body parts of an animal, you know, your bones and your shells and your teeth. So, you know, why would we expect to find a fossil jellyfish when they're like 95% water? Surely there's almost nothing in them to fossilize. But under exceptional circumstances, you can find little impressions in the rock, but you know, they have to be buried really quickly and under the right chemical conditions for that to happen. So as I'm sure you've already guessed if you've watched the previous episodes, we only find them in Lagerstätter. For instance, in the Maison Creek, that's where Tully Monster and the Damanthobamas come from, we found concretions with jellyfish inside. Though how they aren't just like discarded as random blobs of rock, I honestly don't know. Paleontologists who work on jellyfish just have an amazing eye, I guess. And yeah, this is the finished result. I think it looks really cool and magical and mysterious. Um, I love how the jellyfish is sort of semi-transparent. It looks really good. So something that has always kind of bugged me ever since like the start is that, I guess I didn't really plan it, the ammonites are next to the fish. So we're gonna build a third window on the other side and build a sort of cephalopod area back there. So real quick, this is what I've been up to. If we head down here, you can see the ammonites are now visible. I've basically just replicated the same sort of curved window that we have on the other side. And now we have this sort of gantry way overlooking this new, very large enclosure, which is very exciting. Oh, I also have this little opening, which also has a mysterious purpose, which you'll find out in a second as well. So I'm just digging out this tank and there's like a massive ravine right under the aquarium. I had no idea this was here. So if you have any suggestions of how we could use this for something, let me know. Hello, I'm an idiot. <laughs> the animal that lives here is from the Ordovician during an ice age. At this time, there's no land plants, there's no soil, it should all be frozen. What, what am I doing? Why am I, I need to stop going on autopilot. This needs to be completely changed. So I'm gonna try and build like a sort of mini iceberg and I have snow coming around the edges. And um, yeah, it's gonna look way better. There we go, that's way more appropriate. Just need to um, fish out this cow real quick. <laughs> come on, out you come. There we go, right, okay, one sec. So these are giant orthocones. They actually look very similar to ammonites. They are, of course, both cephalopods, but orthocone shells are sort of long and conical. Like I said, they live way back in the Ordovician, about 470 million years ago, which makes them, you know, some of the first big, massive predators that ever evolved. Now, I'm going to very tentatively suggest something that I think could potentially be changed with this mod. I'm not an expert in these creatures, but I'm pretty sure that whilst here they're shown swimming horizontally, which would, you know, make sense, that's how ammonites propel themselves along, I'm pretty sure I remember reading that they'd actually swim upright, sort of facing the ocean floor to grab it you know, crustaceans and other seabed dwelling creatures. A bit like a giant arcade claw machine sort of thing. I might be completely wrong and I'm happy to be proven wrong, but I'm fairly certain that that's how they would maintain buoyancy, I suppose. But they look amazing. I love the color of the shells. Each of these stripes represents a different chamber in the shell. So if you can imagine as they grow larger and larger, the shell sort of grows outwardly and bigger to accommodate the, you know, the larger sort of head, I guess. Oh, oh my god, that scared me. Mm, <laughs> that might need to be changed. So I'm done with this area for now. I know for a fact that more creatures are coming in the future, so I have left us plenty of space and opportunities to expand, but for now, I'm very happy with this. Oh, I forgot about this place. So this little spot is going to be for another group of animals. We actually have some fossil sea snails. So snail shell fossils, they're quite common. There's actually um, there's a big train station near where I live, and there are fossil snail shells like in the marble flooring. I, which obviously I always get distracted by. 
these sea snails are early Paleozoic, they lived about 400 million years ago or so, but it wasn't until about 300 million years ago that snails moved onto the land. But it's weird because we're really unsure about how this transition happened. We know that they, you know, adapted to conserve moisture and all that, but there is a huge gap in the snail fossil record literally around the time that they left the ocean. So at the top of this grand staircase, I basically want to build a big glass dome to house all of our big flying insects. Building a dome in Minecraft is quite straightforward actually, the trick is basically just to come up with a rule and then stick to it. The real challenge is that we're dealing with flying animals, they're going to be very good at escaping, so what I'm thinking is we basically should build like a, like an airlock I guess. We also want to head to the, uh, the, uh, hold off and sit down carefully, okay so we're just going to head to the carboniferous to grab some era appropriate vegetation as well. It's a really nice view from up here too. Actually, I just realised we've not made a map of this place yet. Let's quickly do that before I forget. I wish we'd done this earlier, we could have had like a whole room showing how the sort of base grew, that would be amazing. So we're almost done with the dome, but when I was making the jellyfish tank, I actually realised there's another group that we completely forgot about. So these are crinoids. I forgot they existed <laughs> because, well, even though they're animals, they're closely related to like starfish and echinoderms, it makes the most sense to add them to the game as though they were plants, so I completely missed them in the menus. Again, I'm not going to go through every single species. Honestly, as always, the fact that there's not just one generic species is amazing. So these are crinoids. They have a segmented stem and then a series of branches at the top. The branches are adapted to filter out food from the water and the stem just fixes them to the ocean floor. Or sometimes they can sort of colonize like a floating log and drift around on that together. There's a really amazing fossil of that. And they're still alive today. They have some really cool living descendants, including some that are no longer sort of fixed to the you know sea floor. There's a creature called a feather star, which is all floaty floaty and uses its branches to sort of move around, which is really cool. Anyway, I'm happy with this. Okay, let's move on to the final enclosure. I think it's finally time. Quite pleased with this tower leading up to it. Oh, and this is the um this is the airlock, I love that. And so yeah, let's <laughs> just release these things. Now we often refer to these animals as, you know, giant dragonflies, but they're not actually dragonflies. They belong to a flying group of insects called Paleodictyoptera, I believe I'm pronouncing that right. In a recent-ish video, I played Skyrim and I talked about the evolution of wings in vertebrates, how we know that vertebrate arms evolved into wings, in fact several times in different vertebrates. Insect wings, however, remain a complete mystery. Like what body part, like what physical body part of an insect eventually turned into a wing? Well, fossils of these creatures from the Carboniferous give us a really clear insight into how insect wings might have evolved, but even then we are really unsure about it. Something else, you'll notice that some of these have really nice colourful stripy wings. In some instances, that's just the, you know, the artists behind this mod being really creative, but we actually know more or less what some of them look like because the, some of their wings actually preserved like, you know, colours and patterns on them, which is really amazing. And of course, the most obvious thing that I probably should have said at the start, giant dragonflies, why did they get so big? Well, back in the Carboniferous there was much more oxygen in the atmosphere than today, and due to the way that insects breathe, that just allowed them to grow to such, you know, huge sizes. Maybe that's sort of the function of the airlock, I guess, we can sort of, you know, it's not just to stop that they're escaping, but maybe it controls the atmosphere in here or something, we can sort of pretend? I don't know. Anyway, that, I think, wraps us up for today, but we will be back next week for one more episode to tie up all these loose ends, and I think we're also going to do a lot of aesthetics as well because it's been very much in need of a makeover in some places. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next week for the big finale.